I am not David. He and Mark David are together on a trip, and uh, we pray for their traveling. We pray for their safety. We pray for the mission to be accomplished that they have set out to accomplish. But that being said, he has uh, asked me to fill in both this Sunday and next Sunday, and I'm always grateful to be able to do that, especially just to open God's Word and for us to study it together, because that's all that we are called to do. So if you have been here within the past seemingly, I guess, 14 months now, you know that we are going through the book of Genesis verse by verse, and we have made it in 14 months all the way to chapter 21. So we have a long way to go, but the study of God's first book in our Bible, Moses writes the account of Genesis, is one that is fully full of just God's grace and God's mercy and God's fulfillment of his promise. And that's what we're going to talk about today in chapter 21, and is the birth of Isaac. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 21. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 3 today, but I want us to read verses 1 through 7 to get the full scope of the setting that we're at. So Genesis 21 verse 1 says this, Now Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time of which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? This is God's word in Genesis 21. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for giving us these seemingly simple seven verses in Genesis chapter 21. Father, the fulfillment of your promise that Abraham and Sarah would be given a son, Father. We know that it was you and you alone who fulfilled this ultimate task and grace and promise in their life, Father. Allow us to study it and understand and see your glory in every aspect of it, Lord. Thank you for the blessings that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, as we said, you know, we've been going through Genesis for a while now, and as I hope you've kind of grasped, Abraham is a key pivotal fi figure in the Genesis story. As we know, the, uh, specifically, I was a leader at Camp Winnetoska for a while, and one of the little camp songs that they would sing was, you know, Father Abraham has many sons, many sons Father Abraham have. And it's something that we've heard growing up, especially in children's Sunday school, that Abraham would, was the ultimate father of a multitude of nations. We see that God tells Abraham that the, <clears throat> the number of his descendants are as vast as the grains of sand on the sea, that he can't be counted. But here in the context of Genesis 21, we have Abraham and Sarah, a mere 100-year-old Abraham and a 90-year-old Sarah who have not yet conceived a single son of their offspring. So as you can imagine, the overwhelming desire for Sarah to conceive was burning inside of her. And we see that that desire was fulfilled here in chapter 21. Now, the amazing birth of Isaac is something for us to study. It's something for us to understand, and it's something that I want us to go through this morning. But after we go through the birth of Isaac and its themes and, and understanding of it, I want us to really see the weight of this story and how God is present all throughout it. If you remember, if you flip back a few pages in your Bible to Genesis 17, we talked about this a couple months ago, Genesis 17, beginning in verse 15. You know, the context is that Abraham, a moon worshiper, <clears throat> was visited by God, pulled from his false sense of uh, religion and understanding, deemed righteous in the eyes of God, and acted as a, his remnant to 
transverse the, the Jordan hillside. And Abraham and his wife Sarai, at the, Abram and Sarai at the time, <clears throat> were following the orders of God, going where they were promised to go and led to go. But here we have Genesis 17, beginning in verse 15, it says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a son be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a son? You see, this is one of those few instances in Genesis where we have God himself coming in the presence of Abraham, sitting in his tent and promising Abraham that the fulfillment of their longing desire for a son would be given to them. But you see in verse 17, <clears throat> that Abraham is, falls on his face and laughs and says, certainly, Lord, you, this can't be. You, you know, I've, I believe you. I want to follow you, Father. But the weight of this task is just too much for us to bear. Look at us. We are 100 years old and 90 years old. You see, that, that God, that is, that is too far along in age for us to bear a son. But God continues in Genesis 17, verse 18, Well, Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Verse 19, but God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. Verse 20, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Verse 21, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. If you see the context, the name Ishmael is brought up a mere one chapter prior. We know Abraham, Abram, and Sarai living together, living a long multitude of marriage of life. You know, they're 190 at this time. You can imagine that they were probably married in their early teens. You know, they have spent a lifetime together and a lifetime of Sarah longing for a child. You see, at that time, <clears throat> women at, of the, the time period that were present here in Genesis, their long ultimate desire is to carry forth their husband's name with a son or a daughter. Having a child, being a mother in this time was pivotal for Sarah. But we see as Abram questions God, it says, you know, certainly you mean for Ishmael. Ishmael is the son of Hagar and Abraham. When Sarah comes to Hagar, who is just a maidservant in the house of Abraham and says, I cannot deliver a son to my husband. Please go and be with my husband and deliver him a son. And Hagar does as she's instructed by Sarah. And Abram and Sarah, I mean, Abram and Hagar deliver a son named Ishmael. So you see when God comes to Abraham here, he says, you know, God promises that his covenant will be established with his son. And Abraham says, certainly, Lord, we have been trying our entire lives to have a son. Certainly the time for that has passed. Certainly you mean Ishmael. And God says, no, my glory will be established with a son that Sarah will be given to you. Well, half with you, a son named Isaac. You see, that's the promise that God has established here with, with the ultimate forecoming in Genesis 21 when this, this son is born. And furthermore, the promise that God is giving Abram is even tied down to a time period in verse 21. It says, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. You see, this year that was leading up to where we are in Genesis 21, it's something that we've studied. We see a year full of sin and full of righteousness. We see God striking down the sinful nations of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see Abraham <clears throat> rightfully saving Lot from this, this uh, detrimental of a society. We see Abraham acting in a righteous sense, but also Abraham acting in an unrighteous sense. You know, last week in chapter 20, 
we went through, and Abraham deceives Abimelech. And yes, you can tell a mere single chapter prior to what we're talking about here, Abraham is questioning the validity of what God has promised to them. Abraham, in his fear, puts the nature of Isaac and the birth of Isaac in jeopardy by allowing his fear to overcome him and to give Sarah, his wife, to Abimelech, the king of Gerar. You see, Abram and Sarah constantly go against the promise fulfilled and promised by God through their fear and sin. But we see in verse 21 that God's promise continually is fulfilled, no matter the instance and situation that God's people puts himself in. But as we go through the verse of Isaac, we see in Genesis 17 the promised fulfillment of that son. We see from Genesis 17 to Genesis 20, we see situations where Abram and Abraham and Sarah put that promise in jeopardy to where the, the pure lineage of Isaac might not be fulfilled in Abraham and Sarah. But as you can see in 21, the son is promised and the son is born. And as you can see, that is a miraculous story in and of itself. But today I want us to focus on the true amazing truth presented in this scripture. And it's something that Moses, the writer of Genesis, really emphasizes in these first three verses. You see, Moses writes in 21 verse 1, it says, Now Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said. It continues in Verse 1, it says, And Yahweh did for Sarah as he had promised. Verse 2, So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. You see, Moses isn't uh, just for uh, coincidence sake including the at these attributes and actions of God in describing the birth of Isaac. No, Moses is writing this strategically being inspired by God to write this account this way because the entirety of the blessings of this instance are being fulfilled by God and God alone. All throughout these first seven verses, I know we're only going through the first three, but as we can tell, he's already, as God said in verse one, as God had promised in verse one, at God's appointed time in verse two, as God commanded in verse four, as God had made in verse 6, the attributes and physical blessings of God are scattered throughout these first seven verses in Genesis 21 in describing Isaac. So much so that Moses wants us to long for the fulfillment that God provides in his attributes. And in good Baptist fashion, that's what I want us to go through today. And I want us to cover these in three points. The first of point is God fulfills through his word, which is what we see in the first, asp the first part of verse 1 when he says, Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said. The second aspect I want us to touch on is that God fulfills through his promise, which is also present in verse 1. It says, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he had promised. And the third aspect I want us to focus on is that God fulfills through his timing. And that's presented in the second part of verse 2. It said that Abraham, Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. These three aspects these three fulfillments that Moses is writing about in Genesis chapter 21 on the account of Isaac are paralleled with the actions of Abraham and Sarah, yes, and they, but they all revolve around the unchanging nature of the amazing God that set his righteousness upon Abraham and Sarah. Yes, the, <clears throat> the lives of Abraham and Sarah fruitful in marriage. They've lived a long life of marriage together. They obviously loved each other. Yes, they had moments of fear, but they were constantly trying to have a child. But you see that once it gets to a certain point, 190 at their appointed age, we see that that could only be fulfilled through God. So these three truths on how God interacts with his people are present in the first two verses. But these first two verses and God's truths presented here 
are not just preserved here in the first two verses, but are also present throughout Scripture in the same way that he gives us the promise today. <laughs> there's never a moment, and this is something that David says a lot, says there's never a moment, I think he says that there's not a, a, di- a maverick molecule in the earth that God doesn't control. And in the event of Isaac's birth, that can never be more prominent and never be more true because every instance and every action that Abraham and Sarah go through, God delivers his people and Abraham and Sarah and delivers his promise to the birth of Isaac. As we mentioned before, you got to think of the context in, in chapter 20, what we talked about last week, that the same lie that Abraham presented to Pharaoh prior in the fear that he says in, G- in Genesis chapter 20, verse 2, he says, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. This further proves that God ordained and controlled every instance of this promise being fulfilled because we see a man in Abraham and a woman in Sarah both consumed in their sinful fear that they almost alter the events of Isaac's birth by Sarah becoming the wife of Abimelech. But as we know, God's providence is always in control and God will deliver his people accordingly. So in the context of 21, we've seen Abraham place himself again and again in the presence to where the true fulfillment of God's promise presented in 17 has been put in jeopardy. But we see through the words of Moses in Genesis 21 that God's promise is fulfilled. So getting into the first part, Abraham and Sarah experience the fulfillment of God fulfilling through his word. Moses writes in Genesis 21, verse 1, it says, Now Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said. And as we read earlier, flipping back to Genesis 17, verse 15 and 16, it says, Then God said to Abram, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. This is not some theoretical and uh, imaginary voice that God is delivering this promise to them. No, God uses, comes down onto this earth and verbatimly speaks of the promised son to come. God says, your wife, Sarah, Abraham, will conceive a son and I will bless her and that son. You see, these words that Moses uses in Genesis 21, verse 1, as he had said, are not unique for the context of the birth of Isaac, but also in our study of Genesis and Genesis chapter 1 in the creation account, we see the same use of the word as he had said in Genesis 1, 3, when he says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 6, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, And it was Genesis 1, 9, then God said, then God said, then God said. All six days of creation were enacted by the words of God speaking into the vast expanse of nothingness and creating everything that we see around us. The theme of God speaking is not isolated in Genesis, but when our study of the Christmas message, when we talk about the birth of Mary, God sends an angel to come to Mary and speaks to her that she will be with child, though she has not been with her soon-to-be husband, Joseph. The same bolstering and powerful voice present in this account is also, in creation, also comes to Abraham and Sarah in the mindset of Genesis 16. You flip one chapter back. <clears throat> this is the setting that Sarah is in. Genesis 16, 1, 2 says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne no children, and she had an Egyptian servant woman whose name was Hagar. So right here, Genesis 16, 2, this is the mindset of Sarah. So Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, Yahweh has shut my womb from bearing children. Please go into my servant woman. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. You see, the same voice that speaks into existence, the world that we are standing on today and speaks into existence, us, is the same voice that comes to a longing, hopeful mother and promises her that her desires will be fulfilled. That is the the voice of the God that, that Abraham and Sarah 
experience. Um, Another instance of God's amazing voice is in Mark chapter 9, verse 7. It's the Mount of Transfiguration when God the Father speaks down onto Jesus, Peter, James, and John and says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. The voice of God confirms the deity in Christ. The voice of God speaks into the existence, the account of creation that we study in Genesis. The word of God speaks to Mary and promises her that the Savior will be born to her. This powerful and mighty voice that we see in parallel with that of the strength to create the world is delicate enough to come to Sarah and promise her that her child, her desire for a child will be born. You see, God's amazing voice transcends the depths of the deepest valleys and conquers the heights of the highest mountains. God's voice is seen throughout Scripture as fulfilling promises and enacting covenants with his people, being with his people and guiding his people, confirming the deity of his son in Christ. We see that in several aspects in the book of John that we're going through in Sunday school. We see the voice of Christ the voice of God being all throughout Scripture, comforting his children, correcting those who go against him, guiding his disciples to the promised fulfillment of his death on the cross. And it often leaves us in today, you know, we see these, all of these instances of God speaking to people in Scripture, and we feel like we might be left out from that. But the truth is, is that we are not left out of God's word because we are given the entirety of God's word in scripture. Every word that is present on the pages of this book is the word of God. If you remember our study in John chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God's word in scripture was placed on this earth in the presence of his son and we are given the word of God, the same voice that created the world around us, the same voice that comes to Sarah and Abraham and promises them of a son is the same voice that when we are longing to hear from God, often in our prayers, and I know I'm guilty of it too, we ask God, please just verbally speak to me. And God tells us, he says, I will speak to you. Just open my word, child. Open the word of of this loving God that we have, and he is speaking to us as loudly and as clearly as it was when he was speaking to Abraham and Sarah in the presence of their tent in Genesis chapter 17. This is the voice that Moses, because Moses is writing about in Genesis 21, and the first voice says, Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said. God's voice alone is worthy for us to weigh our hat on. God's voice alone, we can take it to the bank that what God says will, is true and will be fulfilled. But in the same miraculous sense and love that God has for us, we know that the fulfillment in the birth of Isaac doesn't stop at the voice of God. It continues in the second part that we're talking about. And Moses writes, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he had promised. God's effectual voice is enough, but God further proves his worthy to be worshiped by fulfilling his promise that he made with Abraham and Sarah. Now, uh, kind of getting a little Sunday school on us this morning, the word promise is not overly used in scripture, but through our study in the 1689 Baptist Confession, we know that the word covenant is a good parallel with the word promise. The word covenant is generally a legally binding promise that God enacts with his people to fulfill promises that he lays before them. A lot of these covenants we've talked about and grown up knowing, we know that the Noahic covenant is something that we talked about prior in Genesis and that God enacts a covenant, God enacts a promise with Noah in Genesis chapter 9. It says he will deliver him and his family from the, the death of the world from the flood, but also promises that he will not cover the world and destroy the world by flood again. We know that the sign of that covenant is the rainbow today, but the Noahic covenant is a promise deemed by the word covenant that God enacts with Noah. 
Another covenant, probably on the forefront of our hearts, is the Mosaic Covenant. We know that when Moses is delivering the, the people out of Egypt, out of captivity, he gets to the Mount Sinai, he goes up, and God enacts a covenant with Moses and promises that he will, will deliver the people to the promised land. A byproduct of this covenant, we know that the people were longing for a God of kind of strong worldly sense to come out. They wanted a strong ruler. They wanted a written law that they could try to follow and earn their salvation. We know that in the Mosaic Covenant, the promise that God makes with Moses, that he would deliver the people from into the promised land, but he will also instill with us the Mosaic Law, ultimately showing that we can't fulfill the law without Christ was presented in the new covenant. The transition us perfectly to the new covenant in that when Christ enters into the scene in the New Testament, what we talked about in Sunday school in, Genesis, in John chapter 2, when Jesus cleanses the temple, he removes all of the atonement payments for sin, the sin offerings from the complex, leaving him alone in the complex and says, I am worthy enough to fulfill the substitutionary payment for all of our sins. He enacts a new covenant and says that through the blood of my son, my people will be saved. And then there's the Davidic covenant, which parallels with the Abrahamic covenant in that in 2 Samuel 7, God promises that he will establish his throne and his remnant through the line of David. And that promise in the Davidic covenant, the promise God made with David, stems from the promise that is fulfilled here in Genesis 21, and that's the Abrahamic covenant. It's can further fight it in the Davidic covenant, like we said, and God delivers a promise to Abraham that he will be a father of multitude of nations. And if you flip back to Genesis 17, we can see where that is true. Genesis 17, 4 says this. It says, as for me, this is God <clears throat> spoke with, it says, verse 3, then Abram fell on his face and God spoke with him saying, this is God speaking to Abraham and says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations and no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Skipping down to verse 7, it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. You see, God's promise to Abraham and Sarah is not just a gracious God alone gift of a singular son to them, which would solidify the innermost desires and fulfill the desires of Sarah fully to have that single son in Isaac. It gives Sarah a purpose in her heart to be a mother. It gives Abraham the promised fulfillment that God gave him that would satisfy the lineage to be carried on in his name. But you see, God goes a step further and says, yes, I'm going to satisfy my promise and deliver it with you, Abraham, and your son Isaac but I'm going to go a step further. He says, I'm not just going to bless Isaac. I'm going to bless the entirety of the line from here on out. He says, Abraham, when I told you that I, you would be a father of many nations, that doesn't stop with Isaac. That doesn't stop with your single son at a mere age 100 and your wife 90. That single son will mark the start of the covenant promise that God enacted <clears throat> with Moses. I mean, with Abraham and Sarah, as Moses writes about being fulfilled in the first verse of 21. And he says, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he had promised. You see, God's promise is ever present in the lives of Abraham and Sarah. They are promised a mere few chapters earlier that their son would be given to them within a year. We see that Abraham and Sarah transcend a multitude of righteous decisions and sinful decisions, jeopardizing the ability for that birth to happen. Chapter 20 last week is so pivotal in us understanding how close Abraham and Sarah were to losing this promise, but further shows how God sanctifies his people and holds them in his hand. A mere a few moments after Abimelech would have taken Sarah to be his wife, 
and rightfully so would have consummated the marriage and been together as one, if Sarah would have conceived a son, even if she would have gone back to Abraham at that moment, the, the full lineage of Isaac, the full genealogy of Isaac would have been questioned. But God says, no, Abraham, you put yourself in the situation and you put my promised mother and Sarah in a situation where my promised lineage through you could be jeopardized. And he stops it in chapter 20. His promise will always be fulfilled no matter the situation that those whom he works his promise through put themselves in. The life of Abraham and Sarah, yes, is We've seen highs of Abraham and lows of Abraham. We see that Abraham is seen as a man of righteousness in the eyes of God, but he puts himself in sinful situations that God has to save him from, ultimately showing that his promise will be fulfilled. And in the same way that we talked about the voice of God often feeling like, you know, God didn't enact a promise with, with me that, uh, you know, we would bear a child or God didn't enact a promise with me when we look in John chapter 14, we see that the promise present in our life is much greater than the promise that's present in Abraham and Sarah. John 14 verse 1 says this, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, is, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. You see, but this, his promise to return for us is only validated if we continue that narrative in John 14 and verses 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? In John 14 verse 6, a very prominent verse in scripture that we've all heard, Jesus says, says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You see, God's covenant with Abraham was fulfilled through the gift of the son of Isaac, but that promise continues to be sanctified through us today through the salvation and saving of God's remnant through the line of Abraham. The same promise that Abraham was given that his son's lineage will be carried on for the multitude of eternity is the same promise that we live in today. But we long for the promise to be fulfilled with us that we place our faith in Christ and our promise to be with him for eternity in paradise will be fulfilled. You see, Abraham and Sarah put themselves in the situation to where their promise might not be fulfilled in the same way we need to be careful to put ourselves in the situation to where our promise will be fulfilled as well. And to do that is to put your faith in Christ alone. Don't be like Abraham and venture into a, set, a, a sense of sin and worry and doubt, ultimately putting the lives in jeopardy of your son at danger, but place our faith in Christ to satisfy our promise accordingly. You see, in these first verses, we've seen the voice of God fulfilling the doubt and desires of Sarah. We've seen the promise that God enacted with Abraham and Sarah be fulfilled. And when Moses writes in verse 2, So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. You see, God also fulfills in his perfect timing, and that's the the third part that I want us to talk about. You see, Moses writes this key instance of the phrase in verse 2 strategically to show that the doubt and worry that Abraham and Sarah had placed, had been living with throughout their lives was all warranted because it fulfilled the appointed time that God enacted his blessings to be conveyed. You know, we, you know, not to mention it too many times, but we got to note that the age of Abraham and Sarah is important. We hear that Abraham being 100 years old and Sarah being 90 years old, you know, they're, they're not necessarily the spring chickens of parenthood, so to speak, that they have passed their, their point of childbearing age, but that God allows them to have a son. 
And that's important because it shows that f- the appointed time, both in the lives of Abraham and Sarah to where they weren't able to have kids, parallels with the appointed time to where Abraham and Sarah were allowed to have kids because it shows that God alone deserves the glory. Up until this point, I mean, it's easy for us to say that Abraham and Sarah could have been married for 80 years, 75 to 80 years, and you know that they would try time and time again and ultimately be left without a child. And at this point, they would have been given up that the time would be, time, the clock has expired, so to speak. But God delivers at his appointed time a son to them. You see, the ridicule and laughter, the solidarity and the seclusion, the depravity and the depression that Sarah and Abraham had been living through was miraculously fulfilled through the promised word of God at an appointed time. God delivered Isaac into the world to show that it is him and him alone that deserves the glory, and God deserves the glory alone. But We fall back on the love of God, that God deserves the glory alone so much that he could have spoken to existence the being of Isaac. But we see that the weight of this setting is so heavy on the hearts of Sarah and Abraham. And it shows that God's glory is being fulfilled, yes, and that is the first and foremost thing that everything in Scripture points to is the glory of God. But this shows the love that God had for Abraham and Sarah and that he allowed them to experience the joys of parenthood. The longing and suffering and desire for them to have a child for this mere 70 to 80 years of their life was fulfilled by God, and that shows the love that he has for them and allows them to have that, that, <clears throat> that child at that appointed time. And in the same way, as we've talked about the other two aspects, Yes, God's voice is present in Abraham and Sarah and is being confided and supported by the birth of Isaac. It's also present in our lives today how the voice of God is ever most alive in Scripture to where when we long to pray for God, His voice speaks true to our hearts from the weights of this book. In the same way the promise is being fulfilled in Abraham and Sarah is the same promise being fulfilled in us today that we are in the lineage of Abraham. Abraham was our long-awaited father and the promised sons and daughters of God. But we long for the promise today that he will come and save us from the sinful grasp of this world and that we live in a multitude of paradise with him. But God's timing is also being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. You see, God's timing is important, not just merely in the birth of Isaac through the extended age of Abraham and Sarah. God's timing is present throughout Scripture the same way that his voice and promise are as well. God's timing was perfect for Isaac to be born. God's timing was perfect for Christ to be born on this earth, for that for Jesus to be placed on this earth at the specific time to a specific mother and specific father, to a specific tyrannical government that would ultimately put him to death on the cross at that specific time that the tomb that he would be placed into had not yet been filled, at that specific time that he would lead a a multitude of 12 men, ultimately one falling aside, would lead them and guide them so they can carry forth the message of the gospel that is promised to us. The God's timing is extremely important and perfect. And here we are, in the the instance of us in closing, you know, what can we gain from this? We look at God's timing. We look at God's voice expressed throughout the, the words of this book. We see the promises of God longing to be fulfilled in our lives. And we know that the timing of God is perfect. And that should give us comfort if we're in a setting to be comforted by it. But it should be a spark for change if we are not comforted by this. We know that the voice of God is true and the voice of God is explicit in saying that those whom are not in the fold of Christ will not be granted the promised eternity with him. 
We studied it today in Sunday school in John chapter 3 when Christ said to Nicodemus that all must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. All of us must be in the fold of Christ, living a life of sanctification for that coming time that is promised that he will return. See, God's voice doesn't alone satisfy the hearts and needs of Abraham and Sarah. God's voice alone doesn't establish and confide the deity of Christ presented in the New Testament. God's voice alone doesn't enact the creation that we're standing on today. God's voice also tells us that this world is coming to an end. His second coming is on the horizon. That's confided in his voice. That's confided in the promise that he is coming again, the promise that this world will be judged by his son again, and a promise that that appointed time, there will be no additional time after that. There will be no second chance. At that appointed time, at the same instance, at the appointed time when Isaac was born, when the clock strikes zero on God's time for him to come back, those who are in fulfilling the promise that promised to us by living through studying his voice in scripture, that appointed time will be a time of glory and those outside, that will be a time of eternal suffering. So I long for us as we continue to study next week, we'll be in the Palm Sunday message a week after we're longing the story of Easter. It's a time when people around us are more susceptible to hearing the gospel message that God has given to us. You know, it's important for us to know, we say it a lot in Sunday school, that God gave each and every one of us the ability to believe in his word. God gives us the ability to believe. He sends his son to pull us out of our sinful lives to show that the gospel message is true. We can see through the belief that God the Father gives us through the work on the cross that the son established for us that we can see that our sins are horrible in the presence of God. And furthermore, we see that the gospel message is true in our lives and the eternal push and the great commission in Matthew chapter 28. God calls for us to share the same understanding that he's given us to those around us that, that at that appointed time, the fulfillment of his voice and his promise will meet the people around us with the same sense of joy that he has promised us rather than the sense of eternity and sorrow that is promised to those who are not around us. So during this time, allow us to long to solidify and study the voice of God, long for the awaiting fulfillment of his promise, and long for the appointed time that he comes to return us, his children, to be in the presence with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this instance of scripture, Father. A mere three verses, Father, we... <clears throat> often can get bogged down that that's not a lot of scripture, Lord. But when we look at it, the true depths of your word weigh heavy on us in just three verses, Father. We long for your voice to be heard on the, in this scripture, in this book that you have given us, Father. We long to understand the voice that you call out to us by. We long for your promise to be fulfilled both in the Abrahamic covenant that your lineage will be confided and saved through your remnant, but also through the promise of the new covenant that Christ's work was worthy enough for us on the cross, Father. And we long for the promise of the second coming and for us to be in the presence of you to be fulfilled, Father. And we longing for an understanding and an at-ease heart, knowing that your timing is perfect, both of course, for the second coming of your son, Father, but anything that we deal with in this world, whether it's trials and tribulations or glory and accomplishments, Father, allow our hearts to know that it's by your timing that these events take place and it calls for us to worship you, Father. Nothing that we do, the same way that nothing in Abraham and Sarah could do, is worthy for the blessings that you fulfill in our hearts when we see ourselves in situations where the, the blessings are so evident around us, allow us to have the same heart that Abraham and Sarah had and the words that Moses gives them, that we can see that the work that you've done in our lives and know that it is from you and you alone, and that can call us to worship fully. Thank you for this word that you give us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.